I'm so glad to be here. Thank you all for, ha for having me, for asking me to come and share experience, strength, and hope. I love doing this workshop. It's my favorite thing, and, um, and I'm old. <laughs> You, you talked about my head of hair, you know. There was a time when, when my, uh, my hair was bigger, my stomach was smaller, and now it seems it's, oh my God, it's going the other way. So, um, it's, uh, I use notes. It says, uh, tell, them, tell them your name. Why is this, oh, <laughs> it's asking me if I fell down because I clapped. Uh, okay, no, I actually put it on airplane mode so it would stay quiet. So I'm, uh, tell them your name. I'm Jay Westbrook, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jay. Sober today by God's mercy and the practice of the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, tell them about the book. So Mario Puzo wrote it. It was called The Godfather. Paramount Pictures bought it for $80,000 and made the greatest gangster movie ever made. One of the greatest movies ever made. And in that movie, an attempt is made on Marlon Brando's life. He's the head gangster. And they wound him, but they're not successful in killing him. And his son, Michael, who was going to not go into the gangster business, decided to avenge his dad's death. And he killed the, the gangster that tried to kill his dad. He killed the crooked cop, Captain McCluskey, who was, who was protecting that gangster. And, um, and he fled to Sicily. And in Sicily, he was out walking. And he saw Apollonia. And it was amore prima vista, love at first sight. They were inseparable from that moment on, right up until her death, which sadly was not that much, not that far down the road after they got married. And that is my story exactly. Except for the gangster part. <laughs> and except for the Sicily part. But other than that, it's my story. So I said I'm old. It was June 7th, Friday night, June 7th, 1968. There was a party in Pacific Palisades, California that I didn't want to go to. But I knew there'd be some good outside issues, so I went. And about 1 in the morning, my friend George came up with this little blonde and said, Nancy, this is Jay. Jay, this is Nancy. She wants to walk on the beach, not safe at night. Even in the Palisades, go with her. And we took the footbridge over Pacific Coast Highway, I'm using these landmarks for Amy because I know none of you all are from, are from Los Angeles, but Amy knows. Took that footbridge over Pacific Coast Highway, came down in front of Gladstones, and walked that beach for five or six hours. The sun came up. We, we walked and talked. Well, maybe made out a little bit, but, you know, we walked and talked, and the sun came up five, six hours later, and it was amore prima noche. Not love at first sight, but love at first night. And we were truly inseparable from that first morning for the rest of our lives. And um, just a thunderbolt love, absolute thunderbolt love. And um, 11 weeks to the day after our 42nd wedding anniversary, Nancy died in my arms, in our home, on hospice, with pancreatic cancer, you know, and the ground went out from under me, without a doubt, and uh, didn't know if I could stay sober. Nancy died, when she died she had 23 and a half years sober, and uh, I got real clear that I was not willing to disrespect the program that had given her so much, that had given me so much, <clears throat> that had given Jancy so much. We were that AA couple. Jay and Nancy. Jancy and uh, Hollywood, what can I say, or West Hollywood. And, um, and so I reframed my pain, a small price to pay 
for a lifelong love affair. Small price to pay. I took my wedding ring off, took my ring and Nancy's to JR. He's a well-known custom jeweler in Beverly Hills. And I said, melt the two rings together and make me a new one that's thicker and wider. And that's what I'm wearing today. And so you kind of have two for the price of one. You kind of have Jancy speaking to you this morning instead of just Jay. And um, I will tell you, it's so amazing. We were together 44 years, married 42, and the feelings never dimmed, never lessened, never abated. We were passionately in love from that first morning right through till Nancy's death. And I would like to tell you that those feelings were matched by behavior, but that would be a lie. So weren't, you know, we were liars, we were cheats, we were thieves, we both cheated. First time I heard Nancy speak at a meeting, she talked about stealing my cocaine, I was a cocaine dealer, and helping me look for it. And I thought that was just something they said in the room. She'd do, honey, calm down, we'll do it systematically, we'll find it. And she had stolen it, just, oh my God. So, um, Dr. Paul, the guy who wrote Dr. Addict, Alcoholic in the third edition and whatever they call it in the fourth edition, that paragraph on 449 in the third edition, 417 in the fourth edition uh, on acceptance, Dr. Paul and Max, his wife, Maxine, but he calls her Max, um, They have a do-it-yourself couples communication workshop every year. And I heard Lori Chaikin on a Tuesday say that she and Michael were going to it that weekend. And I talked to her after because we were a wreck. I got sober. Nancy and I drank and used together till the wheels fell off. I got sober. She wasn't interested. I got her a big book. She used it as a coaster. I said, come on, come with me. You don't have to be so not interested. And we just were drifting apart and terrified because we loved each other so much. And seven, eight weeks in, she goes, oh my God, you're going to one of those things again tonight? I said, AA every morning, CA every night, yeah. But I've said it, you don't have to be sober to go. And she heard it that time. She said, could you wait a minute? And she ran in the kitchen, and I know you all will appreciate this, whether you're an alcoholic or an Al-Anon, you will understand this, because I, I listened, and I heard the sound of one ice cube dropping into the glass. Because, you know, if you put two or three, there's less room for the booze. One ice cube, she poured a stiff drink, <laughs> did a couple lines of cocaine, and came out with that drink in her hand and a beautiful crystal rocks glass and said, I'm ready. And off we went. And uh, another seven or eight weeks went by. And on my 90th day, Nancy stood up and said, I'm Nancy Morgan Westbrook. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a cocaine addict. And stayed sober the rest of her life. And, uh, and we were a train wreck, you know, because we're alcoholic. And here's alcoholism, uh, grandiose, arrogant, immature, self, everything. Self-centered, thinking I'm self-reliant, self-pitying, self-righteous, self-serving, defiant, in denial, defensive, disrespectful, adversarial, argumentative, unforgiving, scorekeeping, delusional. I mean, how do you make a marriage, a relationship work when those are the qualities that you're both bringing to the table? And Lori said, we're going up to this thing, and, and, and I called, and I talked to Dr. Paul, and I said, we, Paul, I, I got six months, Nancy's got three, and we're a train wreck, we need to come. And he said, I'm so sorry, we're sold out. I said, there's something wrong with your hearing, we need to come. <laughs> and he said, I'm sorry, we're sold out. And I said, we're coming. I, I don't care if you're sold out, we're coming. I don't care if we have to sleep in the car. And they found us a closet <laughs> with two single beds that were in an L shape. And, and we were there. And we repledged our love that weekend. And we came down the hill from the 
UCLA Convention Center in Lake Arrowhead, and I turned to Nancy and said, I'm going to find us some tools to make this work. And two days later, I was in a meeting, and the idea of applying the 12 traditions to relationships, whether they're romantic or with family of origin or in the rooms or in school or the workplace or on the freeway, the idea of applying the 12 traditions was presented. And I want to tell you, Nancy and I got sponsors and we worked the steps, but we lived and loved those 12 traditions because they are so amazing. And there's a, oh, they're not on the wall. There's a connection between each step and the corresponding tradition. All, not, off, not always, but often the step lays out the problem and this tradition lays out the solution. You know, and the problem was that we were loners. And when I say I'm a loner, I mean I lie to you, I lie to me, and I lie to God. And the biggest problem there is I lie to me. I lie and say there isn't a problem, and if there is, it's not my fault. And the problem certainly is not the drink. You know, you're the problem. I don't have a desire to, 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 um, to be sober. I just want to not end up in strangers' beds and in handcuffs and all of the other situations I find myself in when I drink. And I don't have a problem with alcohol. I have a problem with the people who think I have a problem with alcohol. That, they're my problem. So when I tell those lies, there's no chance for me to get sober. But I'm powerless. You know, I'm not insane yet. I'll get insane in step two. But, but right now, I'm just powerless, and my life is completely unmanageable by me alone, and I'm running on self. That's the definition of loner. And there is no solution. And I step into the first tradition, and there's a solution. Our common welfare comes first. The recovery of our marriage depends upon our unity. How many things do I do that destroy that unity? The way I think, the way I speak, the way I act, all of those qualities that I, that I named, arrogant, grandiose, manipulative, scorekeeping, self-righteous, self-pitying, I'm a victim, I'm entitled, you owe me. Remember, you remember six years ago when you, you know, it's all separating, separating me from you, separating me from me, separating me from God. And uh, here's what happened, it was very interesting. My hair really was, my waist was smaller, my hair was bigger, and uh, because of how big it was, it gave me the illusion that I was a mind reader. And I, and I got the idea in early sobriety that the IRS was after me. Now, they hadn't written a letter, which is what they do, they hadn't called, but I knew they were gonna seize the bank accounts. And uh, okay, bank account, singular. So I rushed to the bank, I pulled all the money out, it was $9,800 we were saving for a down payment on a house. I put it right there in the HIP National Bank and the next day I got on my little Honda Shadow 750cc motorcycle and I'm putting around and I have no idea how it happened. But I ended up in front of Glendale Harley Davidson and in the window was a used red soft tail with a price tag of $9,800. And I knew that that meant the God in whom I did not believe wanted me to have a Harley. But Jancy wanted a house and we were saving that money for a down payment, but I wanted a Harley and God wanted me to have it. But Jancy wanted a house and for the first time I made a conscious decision to put the common welfare first. And I got back on that little Honda Shadow 750 cc. I left the Harley in the window, the money in my pocket, and I putted home. And that was a turning point. We stood at the turning point. We stand at a turning point again and again and again, every day, many times throughout the day. And so we ended up creating this workshop and, um, and there's a filter that goes with this, and I swear to God, if you all have to leave, just stay for another 15 seconds and hear this filter, and you can walk out the room, and if you use this filter, your life and your marriage will change. And the filter is just this. 
Is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do going to create greater separation or greater unity? Period. And if it's greater separation, I don't say it and I don't do it. And I live that in my life. And you know what? On the y'all are, you know, this is Jonesboro. Y'all are so nice here, and people like the light turns green, and the car doesn't first car doesn't go. Nobody beeps. Like, what's wrong with you? You know, nobody's on their horn. And then a minute later, he pulls away. People, oh my God, in L.A., they're so serious about their driving, and they will shoot at you over stuff. You know, so. Doing that on the freeway not only creates separation, it creates a life-threatening situation depending on who you do it to. And, um, and so that filter, man, started to change things so powerfully. And then I step into step two, and step two talks about coming to believe that a power greater than myself being able to restore me to sanity, and the implication is that I'm insane or I wouldn't need to be restored to sanity. And it's a nice step, you know? It, it gave me some hope. But hope is not terribly useful. It didn't give me a single tool, not one, for getting rid of the insanity. It just gave me hope. And then I look, and, and I was insane. I have massive, I'll talk about it tonight, but I have <laughs> massive PTSD. <clears throat> trauma that you know in a PTSD you're hyper vigilant any sound is like exaggerated startle response and you can't have your back to the door and you're always looking over your shoulder and, and I need to control everything and everyone so that I feel safe and if you would just do it my way whoever you are my landlord my boss my wife my friends my if you would do it my way I'd be okay but you won't and it makes me crazy it makes me insane that's my insanity. I, I think I'm the ultimate authority. I know what's best for me and for you and for everybody else. You know, there was that, that comedian in the 70s, 80s, I don't know, George Carlin. And he said, isn't it interesting when I'm driving down the road that anyone driving slower than me is a goddamn idiot and anybody driving faster is an effing maniac? <laughs> I'm the only one who knows the right speed to drive on any given stretch of road on any given day in any given situation because I'm the ultimate authority. And when you don't do it my way, I get insane. And nobody does it my way. And so I'm absolutely out of my mind and I step into tradition too and there's the solution. Short version. Jay, there's one ultimate authority. It's not you. Longer version. Jay. There's one ultimate authority. It's a loving God. Maybe if you made room for that God, maybe if you made room for that God, that God would come in, and with that God would come some sanity. What a novel idea. You know, and we started doing that. Holy crap. There's a woman who was, um, well, Let's save that story. So um, the, the tradition goes on to say there's one ultimate authority and then it defines it. It's a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. So we went back to having threesomes, only they were different this time. They were, they were Jay and Nancy and God. This was very different than when we were getting loaded. And, um, and, and it's based on the idea that we see what we look for. We see what we look for, we hear what we listen for. I do a lot of lecturing for medical and nursing students, physicians-to-be and nurses-to-be, and they pride themselves on their observational skills because it's important. They have to see the subtleties and the nuances in their patients to be able to catch what's wrong. And, um, and I do this exercise, and, I, and I'll be in a room, and I'll say, take six seconds, look around this room, spot everything you can that is either silver, silver or black, or maybe brown or beige, whatever colors I choose. Silver or black. Take six seconds, spot it, and remember it. And at the end of six seconds, I say, close your eyes. 
Now yell out everything you saw that was red. And it's silent. And then I say, open your eyes, and they start seeing all the red in the room, and they're so back. We see what we look for. So here's what that group conscience with God looked like. I started looking for a loving God in Nancy. And when we see what we look for, I'd look for it in Nancy. And when I looked for it, I saw it. And when I saw it, it changed how I spoke to her and how I spoke about her and how I engaged her. And now comes the really hard part because it's early sobriety and I absolutely hate me. But we see what we look for and when I look for a loving God in me, I see it. And when I see it, it changes how I speak to myself and how I speak about myself and most importantly, how I offer myself. And just from these first two traditions, that relationship behaviorally changed 120 degrees. And that's the thing of these traditions. They give you the tools to transform deep loving feelings into consistent loving behavior. And now I step over there into step three and turn, make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the, my will and my life, my thinking and my behavior over to the care of God. Not turning it over to God, I'm turning it over to the care of God. You know, the sheep or the cows or the horses or whatever still have to walk up and down the hill. They have to leave the pasture and come down. Even if there's a shepherd, whether that shepherd is a guy with a staff or it's an Australian shepherd dog that's guiding them. So that's what I do. I make this decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, to be willing to be guided by a power greater than myself. It's a lot of words. A shorthand for that is I'm going to do God's work, not God's job. I'm going to do God's work, not God's job. And I'm a hospice nurse and a grief and loss counselor, and I guess that's sort of God's job, God's work. And uh, whoops. <laughs> So, I don't know if y'all, so then I step into Tradition 3, and I don't know if y'all know the history of AA, but those drunks that were so hopeless back in the 30s got this AA thing, and uh, man, they held on, and they wanted to protect it, and they were so terrified it was going to go away, so they got real protective and exclusive. And they said, you know, we want pure alcoholics, we don't want queers. We don't want crackpots. We don't want fallen women. <laughs> don't want beggars, tramps, thieves, asylum inmates, or prisoners. The list is on page 140 in the 12 and 12. So they were very conditional about who they allowed in. And then in the early 50s, along, Bill got the traditions through general service, and we adopted them, and the AA became unconditional any look around this room anybody can come in look at me I mean they even let me in pink shirt oh my god and um, and that's the husband I want to be I want to be unconditional I want to be loving and kind regardless of how Nancy's acting on any given day or what she's saying or how she's feeling my job is to be a husband who is honoring and honorable, passionate and compassionate, courageous and consistent and curious, respectful and forgiving, playful and spontaneous, and a whole host of other qualities, regardless of how Nancy's acting on any given day. Because I want to tell you, man, I'm from Los Angeles, you know, and every beautiful woman in the United States goes either to New York or Los Angeles. We know beauty there. And Nancy was movie star beautiful. Naked, I don't mean unclothed, I mean roll out of bed, no makeup, none. movie star beautiful. She was the kind of beautiful people would look at her and then they'd look at me and they'd look at her and they'd look at me and they would just shake their heads, you know, just like, oh my God, that guy must be so rich or so hung. 
And I, I'm a hospice nurse, so you know you can do the math. And um, so there we are. And um, and when I want to, when I stop being conditional, that relationship gets so much better. And it means I don't know if any of you alcoholics ever did this. There's this thing called scorekeeping. Remembering every good thing I've ever done and every bad thing you've ever done and being very willing to throw it in your face. You know, eight years ago, when we were on our way to San Diego, you said, it's like, Jay, eight years ago, what do you, you know? And what did you say first? Well, I've forgotten that. But, so in being unconditional, we give up scorekeeping. And I allow what Nancy gives, what Nancy offers, to be enough. And in doing that, it makes it safe for her to risk giving more, whether we're talking emotionally, sexually, financially, spiritually, allowing what she gives to be enough makes it safe for her to risk giving more. It's so amazing. And then I step into, into step four. And in step four, I do a searching and fearless, a fact finding and fact facing inventory and in doing that inventory I find out that I was wrong holy crap on a cracker I thought I'm not hurting anyone but me and it turns out that my behaviors my words affect other people I had no idea and I learned that in step four and now I can step into tradition four and effectively work that tradition. And that tradition says, the couple's version is that each partner should be autonomous. That means self-governing, except in matters affecting the other partner or the couple as a whole. So we lived over there in West Hollywood by Plummer Park, and we went to a Monday night meeting in La Cienega Park in Beverly Hills. We had a big, wide, white Chevy Blazer back when the Blazers were really wide, and I drove the right way, south on Martell and west on 6th, and Nancy would go, why are we going down these little side streets? My God, we're going to get sideswiped. And when Nancy drove, she drove the wrong way, west on Santa Monica and south on La Cienega in all the traffic, and we fought. Every, every Monday night, all the way to the meeting. And then we went, wait a minute, fourth tradition. It, whether we go south and west or west and south, we end up at the meeting. So how about driver decides, passenger doesn't advise, counsel, complain, sigh, pout, sulk, yell, or anything else. And most couples can relate to this. Most couples get this driving thing. And so we started getting to that meeting so happy, and people would go, you look different, you guys. What's different? Fourth tradition. And I think that story is pretty cute myself. Here's one that isn't cute, <coughs> not cute at all. I carry a million dollars of uh, life insurance on me, half a million on Nancy, always have, just in case, you know. And um, I guess we passed an age threshold and that annual premium came due. <gasps> and I looked and like, holy crap, that's a big jump. And I looked out the window and Nancy was doing her martial arts, her sword work and her nunchuck sticks. And, and she's slim and svelte and athletic. And, and I looked at me and I was about 50 pounds heavier then and sedentary, I'm a nurse. And, and I said, this is classic. I'm the one who's going to have the stroke or heart attack. I'm the one who's going to die. She's like young and young, healthy, athletic. And so I just made it this unilateral decision and didn't pay the premium on her policy. And 30 days later, they canceled it for non-payment. And 20 days later, Nancy was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and given four months to live. And along that journey, she said, this is so hard. I know you're losing me, but I'm losing you and everyone and everything that I love and care about. And I gotta tell you, I'm really comforted knowing that there's gonna be that half million dollar cushion to carry you through retirement. 
And I couldn't lie because she reads me. She would know in a heartbeat that I was lying and I told her what I did. And she was so pissed. And she said, you know that you've just added to my burden. Like I don't have enough on my plate that now for the rest of my little short life, I have to worry about whether or not you're going to be okay financially in your retirement. Holy crap. Why would you do that? And I had no answer. A thoughtless, stingy, small-minded, disrespectful. I don't know why I did it. You know, I should have talked to you first. And I said, I'm sorry, and she forgave me, and we cried. But here's the deal. If I take a dinner plate, nice ceramic dinner plate, and I throw it on the ground, and it's broken, and I go, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, plate. The plate's still broken. Nancy said, I forgive you, but she still carried the burden of worrying about my financial future right up till her death. And I get to have the burden of knowing that I added to her burden. So this tradition calls me to not make unilateral decisions when they affect my partner or the couple as a whole. Whether it's in how we get to La Cienega Park or whether or not I pay the insurance premium. And then I step into step five. And you know how there's a principle behind each step? Step five is weird. It's got two. So from the sponsee's point of view, in sharing your inventory with a trusted sponsor, there's trust and integrity. But from the sponsor's point of view, there's unconditional love and confidentiality. But unconditional love, some sponsees, I'm an incest survivor. I've had five of the women that I sponsor and two of the men say that they were also incest survivors, but they became perpetrators. And I'm sponsoring someone who's a perpetrator. They've stopped, they're not perpetrating anymore. But I'm listening and my job is to bring unconditional love. That's not easy. But holy shit, if I can bring it to a sponsee who has been a perpetrator when I'm a victim, how can I not bring it to my wife? And yet, isn't it interesting that I can find myself getting into a self-pitying, self-righteous state and I told you I've got this PTSD and it's usually dormant. Nancy was a, an interior plantscaper. It's nice work, but it's hard work. You, it's physical and she puts the plant, oh, she puts the, <laughs> she puts the plants in hotels and banks and rich people's homes in the interior foliage plants. And she's had a hard day and dealing with LA traffic and hard physical work and she loves it, it's plants. She comes home and her arms are full and, and she can't get the door closed and she, she kicks it and it slams. Is my watch gonna go off again? No. And um, it's learning. When I clap, I haven't fallen. Um, and it's like, hey, what are you bringing that anger into my house for? Don't you know that I have PTSD that can get triggered? But wait a minute. It's not mine. It's ours. And it's not a house. It's a home. <coughs> and this fifth tradition says that our primary purpose is to carry the message. Well, what's the message? The message is love and tolerance. And to whom do I carry it? The alcoholic who suffers. It doesn't say the drunk alcoholic living in the bushes outside log cabin. It just says the alcoholic. And Nancy's a sober alcoholic. And if I can reframe her, what I'm calling anger, if I can reframe it as a manifestation of her suffering, then this tradition demands that I bring love and tolerance to her that I replace my judgment with mercy. And again, it's Nancy, so it's not hard. Here comes the hard part. I gotta do it with me, and it's still early sobriety, and I hate me. And without excusing myself from accountability or responsibility, I have to realize that sometimes 
this massive PTSD that I have that's usually dormant gets awakened and when it does it comes out in wonky behavior and instead of sitting there going you piece of sh you effing loser you ass my job is to see it's a manifestation of my suffering and instead of bringing that judgment and criticism to replace that with mercy with love and tolerance and judgment and mercy are exact opposites behaviorally those are those are, those are, that's the pairing. Because judgment comes from the head and mercy comes from the heart. And judgment wounds and mercy heals. And judgment separates and mercy unites. And judgment is me touching pain with fear. And mercy is touching pain with love, that same pain. And then... In six, I get ready to have my character defects removed. And as I, I'm watching the time here, I've got to speed it up a little. And in, and in tradition six, that's the one about money, property, and prestige. You know, and that's where my character defects glare. Money, property, and prestige. And I'm a hospice nurse. I'm not about money. I'm not about property. But the prestige part is... That's where, oh my God, the prestige of being in the, the one in the know when I gossip. Oh, did, did, did you hear Amy and Gary broke up? Nobody knows, but I do, and I'm going to tell you. See how important I am? That kind of prestige. The prestige of being, um, of working harder on a sponsee's recovery than they do. Oh, I'm such a martyr. I'm so noble. The prestige of um, I'm the one with the most horrendous childhood. No, I'm not. I had a horrendous childhood. But I have a good life. And I want to tell you that suffering that happened in my childhood, which was <laughs> profound and constant and ongoing, allowed me to forge, forced me to forge a relationship with suffering. And that suffering became my vehicle for awakening compassion in me and for me and for others. And that's, allowed, that's what allows me to be with the dying to be with this profound suffering, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual, and be there with a compassionate presence and bear witness and not, and, and to have the humility and the compassion and the courage and the restraint to not jump on a white horse and ride in and rescue, to not impose my tools and lesson until they're asked for. That can, that came out of that incest, from that suffering, learning how to be with suffering. So there were gifts of it. I had a bad childhood, and I bet a bunch of people in this room had a bad one, too. I bet some of you had real good ones, like Nancy. She still ended up with the same disease I have, alcoholism, and the same cure, the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. And then in seven, you know, we ask for those defects to be removed. And I step over into Tradition 7 and my life is saved. And we all, all think that's the one that's, uh, let me get a dollar out. It's about the money and passing the bath. And it's not that it's not, it is. We've got to be, you know, we've got to pay our way here. And, um, but the filter for the seventh tradition saved my life. Because I, I'm not a very, I don't know why, I'm not a very good shot with a rifle, with a long gun. But I'm incredible with a pistol, and I've never been trained. And I'm just like, and it turns out that in spite of thinking I'm really good with a pistol, I shot myself in the foot so many times when I was out there with alcoholism, self-sabotage again and again and again. And so the seventh tradition filter is simply, is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do, self-sabotaging or self-supporting. And man, if I can pause for a heartbeat before I push send, before I pick up the phone and tell you what I think, 
before I turn and say to Nancy, what, if I can pause for just a minute, ask that first tradition filter, is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do going to create greater separation or greater unity? Grab that seventh tradition filter, is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do? Self-sabotaging or self-supporting? Man, I start making very different decisions. And then I step into step eight and I do a little three column inventory. Who did I harm? How did I harm them? What were the character defects at play? And I become aware of and sensitized to the harm that I've created, that I've visited again and again on so many people. And now I'm sensitized to harm and I step into one of my favorite traditions, Tradition 8, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, isn't that the one that says AA should remain forever non-professional? What does that have to do with a marriage? <laughs> Everything. So we're at that Monday night La Cienega Park meeting. The meeting ends, and Nancy's talking to this really nice couple. Now, we're not going out to eat with them that night or anything. She's just talking to them, and I'm not a part of it. But I'm over here, and I'm close enough to overhear Nancy say, oh my god, our favorite Italian restaurant's Benvenuto's at La Cienega and, and Santa Monica. And Jay says, no it isn't. It's on the south side of Santa Monica, just west of La Cienega. It's a huge intersection, and if we were going to meet them there in 10 minutes, that might be important information, but we weren't. And I saw the hurt in Nancy's eyes, that I had spoken to her so harshly, and that I had been so desperate to be right that I was willing to make her wrong. And you know what I was doing? I was acting like the professional, because what is a professional? The expert, the know-it-all who's competitive and focused on the win and rigid, intolerant, impatient. It's not who I want to be. I want to be the husband who's the amateur, who does it for fun and for free, who's cooperative, not competitive, who's focused on the journey, not the win, who's flexible, not rigid who's patient and tolerant, who can fall down, or if Nancy falls down, can say it's okay and, and stop and help her up and not worry about, oh, did we lose our place? I want to be a husband who's loving and does it for fun and for free, the path of the amateur, not that rigid, know-it-all, professional, competitive, focused on the win. And then in Tradition 9, Step 9, we do our amends, and at the end of our amends, we say, you know, are there any other ways I've harmed you? What can I do to set this right? It's my intent to not repeat this behavior, and I step over there into Tradition 9, and Tradition 9 says, um, A ought never be organized. And, and to me, what I hear when I hear the word organized is I hear manipulative, because that's what manipulation is. I'm trying to organize your thoughts, your words, your behavior to endorse my position or further my agenda. Got to get you to do it my way, by hook or by crook. And here's the problem with that. Anything I get in the bedroom, in the boardroom, in the bank, <laughs> whether it's money, whether it's sex, whether it's career and work, anything I get from, from manipulation is less satisfying than if I'd have earned it and deserved it. <coughs> and what if God has something better in mind? What's that Garth Brooks song? Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. What if God had something so good and I'm manipulating and being sneaky and trying to get this little thing when there was something. And God goes, okay, well, here's your little thing. <laughs> enjoy. And I haven't even earned that, and so I don't enjoy it. It's not satisfying. And when I'm manipulative, there's no room for curiosity, for humility, or for faith and trust that 
God is going to give me what I need and, and maybe something better than my small vision allows me to see. And then there's step 10, we do daily inventory, and here's the deal with daily inventory. I'm either going to write it or I'm going to create it. <laughs> and either I'm going to take my inventory or I'm going to, that's the laughter of identification. <laughs> we create, in, we write inventory or we create it, and either I'm going to take my inventory, and if I don't, I'm going to take yours. So when I do that and I'm well prepared doing daily inventory, I step into Tradition 10 that says AA has no opinion on outside issues. And we alter it a little for the couple's version. It's not that I have no opinion on outside issues. It's that those are not issues. Those aren't hills on which I'm willing to die. And so people always ask in the Q&A, well, Jay, what's a, what, what is an outside issue? And, and I think the answer varies for each one of us. And I think it varies for me over time. But the, the dodging the question answer is an outside issue is anything that's not an inside issue. <laughs> and I only have three inside issues. My relationship with God, my relationship with Nancy, my relationship with recovery. Everything else is an outside issue. And I may have an, an opinion on it but it's not something I'm going to go to war over. And man, I don't know what's happened in this country. There's such factionalization, you know, urban against rural and young against old and black against white and blue against red and, 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 and everybody's like, yeah. God, recovery, Nancy, and everything else I make exercise my opinion at the ballot box, but I'm not going to get into it. it. The quality of my life depends so much on my behavior and what's in my heart, not, not at who's living in the White House or the governor's mansion or the mayor's mansion, because that's going to change in four years. That's all, you know. So I always think of that married couple, uh, what are they, J James Carville, from Louisiana and Mary Matlin, and one is a staunch conservative and one is a staunch liberal, and they're a married couple, and they disagree intellectually on every political issue. And they're usually on TV together as commentators, you know, point, counterpoint, and never once have I seen them be disagreeable with or disrespectful to one another. And yet they disagree, and this 10th tradition is about learning how to disagree without being disagreeable. And man, in a marriage, there's going to be disagreements, and there doesn't have to be disagreeable behavior. And then in tradition 11, step 11, I do prayer and meditation. And it readies me for Tradition 11, which is my favorite. And it's another one that people go, yeah, our public relations policy on attraction. What does that have to do with the marriage? Oh, my God, everything. Everything. So, <laughs> didn't believe in God, raised atheist, and... Um, and thought, it's very weird. I mean, talk about intellectual laziness. I, blame, I don't, didn't believe in God and blamed the God I didn't believe in for every bad thing that happened in my childhood. Huh? I thought you didn't believe in God. Well, I don't, but it's his fault. Well, how can that? It doesn't make any sense. And, um, and the God I didn't believe in was a Santa Claus God. <laughs> If there were a God, I, I'd have gotten a parking space, you know. I prayed to God, and, and Nancy still died with this pancreatic cancer. I prayed for a miracle. So where's your God? So, so intellectually lazy. And, um, and my prayers, I'll give you what my prayers used to be, because I, I prayed to the God I didn't believe in. I'll give you the prayer with punctuation, in case any of you are... English teachers, um, please, comma, God, comma, don't let that liquor store close before I get there. Please, comma, God, comma, 
don't let those police be pulling me over. Please, comma, God, comma, let the dealer be there and the dope be good. Those were my prayers. You know, and then I found God. I found a loving God that I have an intimate, deep, personal relationship with. And you would think my prayers would have changed, but the prayers remained the same. It's just the punctuation that changed. Instead of please, comma, God, comma, give me this or that, give me some winning lottery numbers. Instead, the prayer is please God. Speak and behave in a way that I believe would please a loving God. And so the 11th tradition filter becomes, as my loving God stands at my side, would that God find what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do to be attractive? And if I don't believe a loving God would find my words or my behavior attractive, I don't say it. I don't do it. It's another one of those amazing filters. And I'm really good. I'm uh, I'm just shy. Where 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 I got I got one tradition left. I got three minutes left. I got um, November one, two, three weeks today. I'm three weeks short to the day of 35 years sober. And I'm really, I'm really good at these 11 traditions. The problem is they're 12. And I'm hoping that I make a little progress on this last tradition by the time I hit 40. But right now, mm -mm. And this 12th step talks about having had a spiritual experience and practicing these principles in all our affairs and carrying the message. And one of the principles is humility. And so I step into tradition 12 and go, fuck that shit. Humility? <laughs> no. I want credit. Look, Nancy, I vacuumed. I know, honey, I see the spots you missed. <laughs> And, sweetheart, I know we don't do scorekeeping, but you know I've vacuumed the last six times. Look, Nancy, I picked up all the dog poop and took the trash out. That's so good, honey. If you lived alone, you'd do the same thing. Why is that a big... I want credit. I want credit. boy. good job. Oh, Jay, you're amazing. I want acknowledgement. I want the, yeah, the applause, confetti, parades, sex and presents, the band playing. So I was lecturing a bunch at these different state conferences, not AA, uh, professionally, uh, you know, Illinois State Hospice Association, uh, all these end of life and hospice palliative care conferences. I was the keynote speaker. And they paid me well. They flew me in, gave me the hotel, paid, gave me a check. And I very quietly used that money. And remember, I was, we were living in Los Angeles where home prices are cuckoo. And I quietly paid down the more, put those towards the principal on the mortgage. And I remember writing that last check. And I walked into Nancy's home office as she's on the computer. And I said, Nancy, I just wrote the last check. The house is ours. We paid off, I paid off the mortgage. And she was, and she stopped and she looked and gave me that million dollar smile and said, oh my God, honey, that's amazing. I love you. And went back to work. <laughs> and I'm like, what, wait, what? Where's the band? Where's the sex and presents? Where's the confetti? Where's the parade? Where's the, this is the most adult thing I've ever done. Why are you? And she stopped. I forgot where she was from. Grew up 18 years in one house, loving, stable, supportive home in Wichita, Kansas, Midwestern work ethic. And she looked at me and said, sweetheart? When she says sweetheart, it's like, uh-oh. She said, sweetheart? They lent us the money, and we paid it back. 
that's what we were supposed to do, and went right back to work. And I'm like, no, 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 I want the... So I'm not good at the 12th. That's what the 12th tradition is, but I'm not good at it. So I'm still working, work in progress here, you know. And um, I just hope that somebody in here got at least one tool out of this really quick walkthrough of the 12 traditions. I'm doing this talk again Monday on Zoom in uh, Berlin, Germany, but it's on Zoom. It'll be at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. If you're interested, I can get you that information. If you think rehearing it would help, same jokes probably, and maybe a few different ones. But I hope that you all got something out of it. And what I'm going to do now is end it, but open it for, I'm done blabbering up here, but are there any questions? Does anybody have a comment or question they'd like to, to make on this? How interesting. Usually there are like a ton of questions. So yay, I must have been very clear. Um, you sound good. Yay! That's that's good to hear. Where's the confetti? Where's the parade? And and where's the sex and presence? <laughs> um, okay, then that's it. How? What? What do we do to end? Do we do the Lord's prayer? Is there a reading? Is there a?